If you think about why the curve inverts, it starts with the banking system and the financial institutions, not only in the United States, but outside of the United States. Because banks have balance sheet capacity, which they could allocate in several different ways. Uh, number one, they could lend into the real economy uh, to entrepreneurs and businesses who are trying to create more goods and services. Uh, or they could go ahead and buy the 10-year treasury. Let's say just the, the risk-free asset with safety and liquidity being a premium. So what happens when you go into a cycle like we're in right now that we've seen over and over and over and over again, going all the way back to the 1950s, is the banks and the entities in the uh, financial economy start to take risk off the table because they look around and they say, okay, there's no good opportunities out there to lend when you look at the risk versus reward. It's not just the reward, you have to include the risk. So what they do with all that balance sheet capacity is they start buying the long end of the yield curve uh, because that's their, their best bet. And that along with the Fed increasing interest rates is usually when you get the inversion, which is just a fancy way of saying short-term interest rates are higher than long-term interest rates. So it's all just the market telling you that there's a lot of risk out there that a lot of times the stock market, quite frankly, isn't pricing in. You talked about 2.8% GDP growth. Okay, well, let's put things into perspective. It's not that like that's awesome year over year. I mean, that's not it's higher than expectations, but expectations were incredibly low. When you look at the trend line, that's still below trend growth. And as our good friend Jim Rickards always points out, that's the definition of a depression, an economic depression. Uh, another thing that I would say is if you look at these economic cycles, I mean, going back to the GFC, how many people were out there preaching in 2000, even at the beginning of 2008, that we were in a recession? Now, everyone, if you look at the Wall Street Journal, the archives, which I do a lot, they're all talking about a soft landing. They're talking about the genius of the Federal Reserve, how they just brought interest rates down to a perfect level or up just to a perfect level to where they can you know, beat inflation, but they don't have to worry about jeopardizing the unemployment rate going up too high. It's it, People say this stuff, it's just um, unbelievable. You know how this time it's different, this time it's different, this time it's different. Now, the cycle has been longer than usual. What we typically see is 18 to 22 months. Uh, as you said earlier, we've gone about 24, a little over two years, but that's assuming we're not in a recession right now. And you say, George, well, how can you say that if you've got real GDP growth at 2.8%? Well, fine. That's also assuming that the, the CPI or the deflator that they're using is actually accurate, right? Because that's real GDP. So if you take nominal GDP and let's say you deflate it by 2%, and that's what gives you the 2.8%, but really the deflator is 5% or 6% or 7%, which I think most of your audience would agree is, is the real inflation rate. Well, now all of a sudden you've got negative GDP if they just calculated the numbers honestly or more honestly like they did in the 1970s and the 1980s. But all the proof that we need is just sitting right there in the bond market. And let's go back to the banks and look at what the banks are doing because, and I, I go back to the banks because they're the ones that have the most intel, right? They're the ones that are dealing with the entrepreneurs. They're the ones that are dealing with the multinational corporations. They're the ones that are dealing with commercial real estate. They're the ones that are dealing with the consumer. And most importantly, they're the ones that are dealing with other banks. And as you know, most of the dollars in the world are created by lending them into existence, meaning the banks create the majority of the dollars. It's, it's not the Federal Reserve or the Treasury or the government or anything like this. It's the banking system lending them into existence. So just look at the monetary aggregates. I mean, since 2022, M1 money supply and M2 money supply in the United States is down, down. And to give your viewers some context, the last time that happened with M2 money supply, we were in the Great Depression, not, not the Great Recession, the Great Depression of the 1930s. So if we have this booming economy, why aren't the banks lending? Just ask yourself that. Is Do they not want profit? Are they somehow not greedy? Of course not. The reason they're not lending is because the risk reward doesn't make sense because when they look out at the real economy, they see storm clouds. They don't see a booming economy. They see a lot of problems. They see massive counterparty risk. I mean, let's not forget that we're just in the middle innings of a banking crisis. We go back to 2023 with Signature, First Republic, and to your earlier point, Credit Suisse, we were talking about that, how all these banks 
basically went bust in March of 2023. They came out with the bank term funding program, the BTFP. The Fed had to come in and, and quote unquote save the day, but all they do is just really kick the can down the road. And since that time, for whatever reason, the mainstream media thinks that, oh, we dodged a bullet. You know, we have averted the crisis. Well, no, you didn't, because every single month we hear in the news that another bank goes bust. Another bank goes bust. And not just in the United States. You say, oh, well, George, it's just the mid-sized banks with commercial real estate. Okay, well, that matters. <laughs> Believe it or not, that actually matters. And that impacts the big, huge banks, not only domestically in the United States, but maybe uh, to the same degree, these banks outside of the US in the euro dollar system. Why? Because it increases counterparty risk. And if you increase counterparty risk, you decrease dollar liquidity because the banks are the ones that provide that dollar liquidity to begin with. But then we fast forward more recently and we look at Norin Chukin Bank. Another thing that we discussed earlier, this is this big Japanese bank that had to take a 10 billion billion dollar loss because their dollar funding costs went up because you guys know that the way banks make money is they borrow short term and they lend long term. Well, that's fine when your borrowing costs are 1% and then you buy treasuries at 3%. But what happens when your short term borrowing costs go up to 5, 5.25%? Well, the 3% that you're making on the treasuries now all of a sudden becomes a loss. So you have a negative carry on those. And this has nothing to do with the deposit flight that we saw with uh, Signature First Republic or Silicon Valley Bank back in March of 2023. This is a completely different risk that the banks are facing. So what they inevitably have to do is they have to sell those assets that are yielding 3%. Those are the risk-free assets, i.e. treasuries, the ones that you're guaranteed to at least get your principal back. Yeah, you, know, you can debate as whether or not your purchasing power is the same, but you're at least getting your principal back. They have to sell all those and they have to buy an asset that is yielding more than their funding costs. Let's assume their funding costs are 5%. That's what they're paying on the liability side of their balance sheet. Okay, great. Well, think about how far out the risk curve they have to go to get seven or 8%, which is exactly what they need. Well, if we listen to what their statement was when they announced this $10 billion loss, they're gonna have to, the only way they're gonna be able to get that return they need is to buy CLOs, to buy derivatives. And what's the underlying asset for these derivatives? Oh, well, that would be commercial real estate in the United States. And it'd also be junk debt, which by the way, these corporations, they can't get normal debt from a bank. So they have to go to some guy, a sponsor for a CLO, which is borrowing money from the bank to give it to the borrower that can't get it from the original bank to begin with. So you have this massive daisy chain of risk. And what these banks realize is that they're all interconnected. People think that, oh, well, if Silicon Valley Bank goes bust, or Norin Chukin, well, it doesn't really matter to the whole system. They look at it as though it's an isolated instance. And what they have to understand is the global monetary system is simply a network of bank balance sheets. You know, the example that I like to give people to understand how the, the, the banking system works right now, let's remember, if the banking system fails, guess what happens to the economy? It crashes. There's no way that you can have a financial crisis and not take the economy down with it. That's just the way things, it's not the system I want, but it's the system we have. So going back to the example that I like to give people to get a visual of how the banking system works, it's very similar to these Tour de France races. You know, if you go back to the 1800s, the way the banking system was set up, it was interconnected to a certain degree, but not extensively to where there was all this systemic risk. So if you had one bank go bust, well, back in, let's say, the late 1800s when we had free banking, it would be similar to seeing one of these bike crashes in the Tour de France, where the guys at the front of the pack are separated by like 20 yards, where each guy is there's 20 yards of distance between him and the next rider. So if one guy crashes, gets a flat tire, goes over the wall, well, it sucks to be him, but it only impacts that one rider. That's the way the system was. But you fast forward to the 1950s when the Euro dollar system was created as a result of Bretton Woods. Because the way Bretton Woods was set up, the global economy depended on the United States running deficits to the extent where there are enough dollars getting out of the US. And the US couldn't do that. So the banking system outside of the, the US said, well, we have all, all this demand for dollars. We'll just create these dollars by ourselves. And now we don't have dollars. We don't have bank reserves. 
but we'll just create these dollars by lending them into existence. So the offsetting asset is just simply that dollar asset that we just created by XYZ Corporation borrowing the money. And then what happens is when they transfer that liability that they just created to another bank, well, that bank just extends them credit. And they go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth to where every single bank's assets are the other bank's liability and vice versa. You see, so then we get to the 1950s where it's like a Tour de France crash where they're not just separated by 20 yards. Let's say they're more tightly together. Now, they're not all compact, but they're tightly together, let's say in a straight line. So if one guy goes down and gets that flat tire, he takes out, let's say, 5% of the other riders. But now it, it's to the point where every single rider isn't yards apart or inches apart. They're millimeters apart. They're millimeters apart. So if one of these bikes goes down at the front of the, the race, then it just wipes out. It's like a domino effect. It just wipes out all these other riders where 90% of them fail. And it's the exact same way the banking system is set up right now. And we know, we know the banks are seeing this because we don't have to watch what they say or listen to what they say, just watch what they do. And the fact of the matter is they're not lending into the real economy. They're buying treasuries, which are the safest and most liquid assets for the banking system. And this tells you that they're looking out at the other riders and they're seeing the guys at the front of the race and they're seeing that every single one of them is about to have a flat tire, even though they're going 50 miles per hour. So you, because that, you, then that's a reference to GDP. So you look at GDP and you say, oh, it's 2.8%, right? Well, the banks are telling you that although it's 2.8%, that there's a very high probability that it's going down to negative very soon. And again, it's, it's not what they're saying. This is not George Gammon's opinion. It's just me looking at the reality of how they place their own bets and what they do with their own money. And it just was, to give your audience some context, let's go back to the GFC. What do you think the unrealized losses were back then? I can tell you right off the top of my head, right around 75 billion at the height of the GFC. Now, 700, 10 times, basically 10 times the unrealized losses. So the only rebuttal there is, oh, wow, well, wow, well, wow, well, George, those are mostly treasuries or mortgage-backed securities or whatever. They can hold to maturity. They're not marked to market, so it doesn't really impact their balance sheet. Oh, really? Well, tell that to Silicon Valley Bank. Tell well, that to Signature. Tell that to Norrin Chukin. The whole reason they're getting into to problems, not the whole reason, but it's because they have to sell those assets which were hold to maturity. So they have to realize the unrealized losses. <laughs> and that goes back down to credit risk. So if you want to talk to me about credit risk, great. Let's look at commercial real estate. Let's look at the junk debt. Let's look at how tight the corporate bond spreads are. Most people think that's a result of the market saying, oh, well, we don't see any risk out there. I beg to differ. I think it could be a result of all these foreign banks having to sell their safe and liquid assets and go further, further, further out the risk curve, not because they want to, but because they have to. And the only underlying asset that will give them that return is junk debt <laughs> and so forth. And so then it compresses the, the actual spread. But now you look at the, the unrealized losses, which was a fantastic point. It's actually something I'd written down. You look at the credit risk out there with these banks just not being paid back. But it's not just a commercial real estate, it's auto loans. Look at the delinquency right there. Look at the delinquency rate on credit card loans. Do you think that these uh, delinquency rates would be skyrocketing if we were in a booming economy? In fact, I read a report the other day from CNN. So this is not zero hedge or something like that. From CNN stating that 39 percent of people they polled said that they worry about having the ability just to pay their basic expenses. And to give you some context, that's up from 28 percent during the COVID lockdowns, and it's up from 37 percent at the depths of the GFC, the depths of the GFC. It's higher right now, people concerned about their ability to pay their bills. So tell me if the economy is booming, if it's running on all eight cylinders, why is it that 40% of Americans are worried that they're not even going to be able to put a roof over their head or put food on the table moving into 2025? 